Hello, everyone. We'll wait for a minute or two to give people plenty of time to get on, and then we'll start proceedings. So welcome to uh, the first Stanford online lecture for this year and first online lecture ever. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our schedule, like everybody else's, was uh, disrupted by the pandemic, but we've made adjustments and are moving online. Uh, so first of all, I want to just say a few things about uh, the mechanics of the talk and then go on to announce the, a few uh, upcoming events at the center, uh, and then I'll turn it over to the introducers. Um, we'll probably go to maybe 8.05 or 8.10. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, having a webinar is that uh, if you have something you need to do at 8, you can always leave without disturbing things. The way to ask questions in a webinar uh, is to use the Q&A. Uh, you can send those questions at any time, uh, although we will be, of course, waiting till the end of the talk to do that. So you, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you can see a Q&A and click on that and type your question. Uh, unfortunately, one of the uh, disadvantages of having a, a webinar is that people can't applaud. Uh, so uh, if you particularly struck uh, by how much you enjoyed this talk, uh, you can always in the Q&A also just express your thanks. Now, as I said, this is the first Stanford online this year. Uh, the next one is on November 12th at seven, and it will be presented by Mary Beth Norton, uh, a prominent historian and a past president of the American Historical Association. And she'll be talking about 1774, the long year of revolution. Closer in time, we have a new series called Humanities Hour, which is focused on allowing human, uh, humanities faculty at UM to talk a little bit about their work without necessarily being related to a specific project or book. And next week, again at seven o'clock, Chantel Acevedo, who's the head of the writing program in the English department, will be talking on historical fiction a novelist approach to researching and writing 19th century Cuba. A more traditional program is uh, our book talks, uh, normally given at Books and Books, but now online. Uh, and our next one is on uh, Wednesday, October 7th at 8 by Britt Brogard uh, in our philosophy department. And she'll be talking about her book, which is entitled Hatred, excuse me, Hatred, Understanding our most dangerous emotion. So uh, I hope you'll look into or think about attending those. Uh, all our uh, upcoming events are on our website. And with that, I'll turn it over uh, to my colleague, Yolanda uh, Martinez San Miguel uh, and uh, her fellow introducers. Thank you so much, Hugh. Uh, so I would like to welcome everyone to this lecture hosted by the Center for the Humanities as part of their Stanford Distinguished Professor Series. Dr. Nelson Maldonado Torres, who is a professor at Rutgers, uh, has a joint appointment in the Department of Latino and Caribbean Studies and in the Program in Comparative Literature. He's the chair of the Program in Comparative Literature and the director of the Rutgers Advanced Institute in Critical Caribbean Studies. He has many publications and a very important first book entitled Against War, Views from the Underside of Modernity that was published by Duke University Press in 2008. But here uh, I, we want to diverge from the usual format for these presentations to talk about uh, dimensions of uh, Maldonado Torres's work that you will not be able to find in links about his work. We have decided to do a three voice introduction and I will start by sharing two moments uh, in Professor Maldonado Torres' thinking and work that have been transformative 
in my own uh, thinking. Like Dr. Maldonado Torres, I grew up in Puerto Rico and studied at the University of Puerto Rico, where I learned that philosophy belonged to the global north, and therefore there was no philosophical schools of thought in the Caribbean and Latin America. My first encounter with Professor Maldonado Torres' work was reading his article entitled Pensamiento Crítico desde la Subalteridad, Las Conciencias Sociales en el Siglo XXI, Critical Thought from the Position of Subalterity, Ethnic Studies as the Colonial, as, um, ethnic studies as the colonial Sciences or Toward the Transformation of the Humanities and the Social Sciences in the 21st Century. In this essay, Maldonado Torres traces the origins of ethnic studies in dialogue with the emergence of area studies in US American academia. He then proposes a redefinition of Latinx and ethnic studies to analyze the epistemological labor done by the scholars and intellectuals cultivating these transdisciplinary fields of knowledge. According to Maldonado Torres, trained in philosophy and religious studies, the task of the decolonizing intellectual and those who work in ethnic studies is to question the epistemological and institutional structures that guarantee and perpetuate the centrality of Western European notions of knowledge and humanity. Moreover, the colonization conceives a new conceptual path to overcome these colonial legacies. His book, Against War, proposes a close reading of the philosophical work of Levinas, uh, Fanon, and Dussel to question the naturalization of war and violence as the hegemonic model in the conception of human history and ontology, and to propose a decolonized epistemology. A second moment in Maldonado Torres's work is his essay, Thinking at the Limits of Philosophy and Doing Philosophy Elsewhere, From Philosophy to the Colonial Thinking. This essay includes a rare moment in uh, Nelson Maldonado Torres's writing because he allows us to see a glimpse of his own struggles, losses, and challenges while trying to produce philosophy from a colonized space like Puerto Rico and he interrogates comparative and interdisciplinary modes of inquiry and finds them limited because they do not question or transform the limits of institutions and disciplines that were not formed with coloniality and non-whiteness in mind. In his search for a space in which these questions could be formulated, Dr. Maldonado Torres is fine, ethnic studies as a space in which knowledge is question-driven instead of driven by methods or objects of study. In his work, transformation through the colonization is key and rethinking all the premises in which our thinking is developed is a crucial exercise to learn with others and to learn, learn, let others learn. In his work, he transforms the Cartesian, I think, therefore I am, into I think, and I am in relation, therefore I decolonize. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Miguel Vasquez, and I'm a third year uh, English PhD student. And not unlike Dr. Martinez Amiguel, Dr. Maldonado Torres's work has been crucial to my growth as a scholar. His words introduced me to a vein of decolonial thought at a time when I was first unpacking who I am relative to what I hope to contribute. In just my second year of undergrad, I came across his article, Race, Religion, and Ethics in the Modern Colonial World in which he argues that race and religion have been deeply intertwined in the global project of modernity, and that any posit against his ills necessitates a decolonial lens. In dialogue with theorists, the likes of Aníbal Quijano, Sylvia Winter, and others, he addresses an ideological reorientation of the Earth's geography based on ethics, the age of discovery's will to force the globe into a rotation around Anglo-Christian expansion. Ethno-racial categories and their accompanying ontological conclusions about African and Indio bodies circumscribed an existence of non-being. Through modernity's eyes, these empirical classifications transformed from designations of who is out of God's grace to the pseudoscience of racial difference and then finally genetic difference. I was able to grasp that these same racial technologies as yet still violently shape our present and Christianity, colonization, and modernity are uh, a language through which we can trace that chronology. Dr. Maldonado Torres' text was my gateway into not only decolonial thought, but a politics of relationality for our present moment. While at the starting line of my academic career, these ideas placed my Puerto Rican and Dominican heritage into contention with my Roman Catholic upbringing. 
I developed a humor hum hermeneutic, excuse me, of suspicion for rhetorical contradictions tied to words such as citizen, illegal, non-believer, and freedom. An utterance like, I don't worry about politics, only my faith in God, read far more violently to me. I could see that foregoing ethics within the ruminations of religious philosophy was an attack on bodies deemed to be non-human. This is particularly apt in light of the verdict carried out for the men who murdered Breonna Taylor. In the face of this supreme injustice and the ongoing terrors of our time, may we never stop embracing the loving networks established amongst our kin, and to paraphrase Dr. Maldonado Torres, reorient ethics to prioritize ourselves in conditions of systematic dehumanization. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nadia Amr, and I am a PhD student in Literary, Linguistic, and Cultural Studies here at UM. I've had the opportunity to study Dr. Maldonado Torres' work alongside Miguel and Dr. Martinez San Miguel, and in doing so, encountered this passage from New Approaches to Latin American Studies. The shift of thinking about colonialism as an object of study to considering it as a generative epistemological foundation of the modern world, or as coloniality, involves a decolonial turn. The decolonial turn presents a vision a horizon of action and an orientation that differs from the vision, horizon, and orientation of modernity. For me, this image of the turn is powerful in its evocation of both bodily and psychological descent. For to turn oneself away means to turn oneself towards something else, towards another horizon. If I'm to trace my own heritage from colonized India to colonized Pakistan to the colonized United States, I find myself like so many of us, deeply enmeshed with the order of modernity, the hegemonic enterprise of civilization of which I am both a product and a reproduction. To make that turn towards a new horizon is to turn inwards into an embrace, an embrace that encompasses many worlds in one. We at the University of Miami are a community of learners who presently occupy the traditional homelands of the Tequesta, Seminole, and Miccosukee nations. We recognize this land as an expression to those on whose territory we reside. Land acknowledgement does not exist in a past tense. Colonialism is a current and ongoing process. We must build our mindfulness of what histories we have brought to this land, and we seek to understand our place within those histories in order to strengthen our resolve for decolonization as a project, as our collective embrace. So we are, we are now ready to start the, the presentation. Uh, the floor is yours, Nelson. Thank you so much for such a generous and beautiful in introduction. And I feel compelled to continue the dialogue and hopefully I can be as generative. What I'm going to present could generate as many good uh, uh, thoughts and goodwill as you have generated uh, so far. And uh, now uh, the three presenters, but also uh, to the, the staff and the director of the uh, Center for the Humanities, I want to thank for their generous invitation and opening this space uh, to share some of some ideas about uh, whether the colonial humanities are possible. Uh, this is actually, uh, I realize now that, that uh, the first conference of the Caribbean Philosophical Association where uh, that I organized as president took place at the University of Miami uh, already. When was that? Around 2008, 2009. Uh, so uh, this would be this is my second time in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle, you know, virtually, but uh, still I'm very happy to reconnect and now uh, meet uh, some of you that I didn't have the opportunity to meet then. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be in this space with you. And I am going to uh, project my screen. I initially pre was preparing kind of uh, heavy, heavy theoretical philosophical presentation. And when I was reading it, I realized that I read that I would probably lose many of you in seven to 10 minutes. And if I was you, I would probably be lost myself. 
Uh, so I decided to do something else and to use a, a kind of a PowerPoint and to go out on other space with some, you know, we can, a, a different style, which I think drive the point uh, equally, hopefully even better and uh, can serve as a platform to have a conversation about the topic. So um, let me project my screen and then we'll continue. Okay. So you are seeing the full screen now, right? This end, okay. So this is the title of course, and I want to, okay. I want to, uh, First, uh, I mean, the presentation, the title is a question, and that is not accidental. I think there is something about the need to ask new questions that we have not uh, asked enough or they are to ask. And some questions that raise critical insights about our own preferred uh, intellectual treasures and uh, paradises like the humanities. And we need to go there. I think that when we say Black Lives Matters, uh, we have to be uh, today, um, we have to dare to ask new critical questions. Uh, otherwise, I think that we collapse too easily into responses that uh, sound like Black Lives Matters, but ultimately they are repeating in a different way, all lives matter. And I think that the humanities have a burden, an extraordinary burden in that they cannot only say generally we support Black Lives Matters, but that they do not reproduce an all lives matters perspective. I think for too long, the human in the humanities and the humanities as a project has been an universalizing project that only recognize racial differentiations as differences uh, of different kind. And it has never uh, understood or grappled the gravity of what is anti-Black racism and what is coloniality. And for that, we have to ask new questions. And so this presentation will be uh, about this. And um, I have, uh, let me here. So I have divided these in three acts. Act one, the humanities in US colony. Right? It's like visiting, if we want to uh, determine if there are any decolonial humanities where one place may be to see how they operate in an actual colony, then how they actually how they operate in the US, which is another kind of settler colony. And then uh, we can then enter into the question whether we can go to towards the decolonial humanities. And so let me start with the first, the humanities in US colony and the colony in question is not so far, farther from, I mean, closer from you than it is from me, and it is my home of Puerto Rico. And so I want to start, if I want to know what the humanities are in a colony, I thought that I would uh, dedicate uh, a little bit of time to look at the work of someone who may be the, the, the premier humanist in Puerto Rico, Professor Luce Lopez Barral. And she was, uh, not too long ago, last year, the kind of keynote speaker in the 75th anniversary of the Faculty of the Humanities at the University of Puerto Rico. And I think uh, probably no one better than her to do, to do, to, to, do uh, to participate in that role. And so uh, there you see in, a, in one of her columns in the local newspaper in Puerto Rico, uh, it may be the best sold newspaper perhaps, El Nuevo Dia, uh, she wrote this column in, with the title, La Universidad de Puerto Rico me lo ha dado todo. The University of Puerto Rico has given me everything. And the, the column and her talk was a celebration of, of the, the, the university, what the university gives to the island and to scholars like her. There are lines in this, um, in her uh, description that uh, she calls the university as a paradise because even her parents met on campus and as a child, she remembers being on campus, right? That really was her home in many ways. She brings out that, uh, that uh, she refers to the university as her home, uh, as this paradise and this literal because of this. She says that she developed 
and a sentido de identidad puertorriqueña, a sense of being Puerto Rican in the context of the university. Uh, she says that the university gave her, me dio vocación de humanista, gave her the vocation of being a humanist, a humanities uh, a scholar too. And uh, she also said that, uh, narrates there, you know, she's a very prominent scholar, actually uh, not so long before she was given this recognition in Puerto Rico of delivering this speech, she was given a doc uh, a honoris causa degree, uh, honorary degree, doctoral honorary degree by the Universidad Complutense in Spain, is one of the most prestigious universities in Spain. And she narrates that when she was chair of the Department of Hispanic Studies, she got offers from universities like Harvard and Brown, and she declined them. And that she said that this is greatly in part because of her uh, love with uh, uh, the University of Puerto Rico and the island, and of course her scholarly humanistic vocation there. This, by the way, is the, this is a picture of the University of Puerto Rico uh, uh, in Rio Piedras, in the campus where she, she uh, teaches, uh, where I also went to uh, university, uh, to college. And, uh, and uh, I want to um, take us to another column of Professor Lopez Barral. And this is a very recent column, September 13, 2020. And the title is, How Does a Colonized Person Feel? So suddenly I think that we're landing almost directly into the territory of the decolonial humanities, one would think, right? Because now a humanist is addressing the question of how does, uh, how does it feel to be a colonized person, right? And you can hear the echoes of W.B. Du Bois, how does it feel to be a problem? And uh, in this column, she um, uh, writes about the collapse of Puerto Rican identity by, uh, you know, the fact that we are the territory of the U.S., we are a, colonial, a colony of the U.S. And she laments the the military takeover of Puerto Rico, of the U.S. in Puerto Rico in 1898. Uh, she uh, laments not having embassies, uh, having to recite the pledge of another land while you are in Puerto Rico. Perhaps you have never come to the U.S. All of these contradictions that undermine your sense of identity when you are in the island. And also the education, which tries to uh, replace one identity with for another. As she writes. Now, she, uh, interestingly enough, in this, well, in this uh, column, she cites a number of authors, uh, pretty much in the second paragraph, and uh, authors from different places who have written also about the colonized subjectivity, about colonized subjectivity. Albert Memi, Homi Baba, Edward Said, and she mentions Fanon. And when she mentions Fanon, she cites the wretched of the earth. Uh, the very uh, relevant point here is that uh, Fanon wrote an even uh, more explicit text about colonized subjectivity and is black skin, white masks. And in Puerto Rico, it is very interesting because in the, uh, Fanon is much better known by the pressure of the earth, los condenados de la tierra, by than black skin, white masks. Uh, whereas in the US, there is more reading of, you know, black skin, white masks than pressure of the earth, at least in the last 20 years or so. Uh, I would not diagnose that part of the continental state side of the US, but I will point that in the Caribbean, it is, it is more baffling because black skin white mask is about a Caribbean island. Uh, Caribbean island that is under the French, on the French power, it's a colony of France. So it is in a way uh, quite direct uh, a parallel to Puerto Rico, right? And uh, now the question is that he's talking about blackness, it's about blackness. And so, so why would that book or that reference would not be featured here? There's no signs that it would be, that it's featured in this kind of lamentation about the colonization of the Puerto Rican psyche. And uh, what one notices is that in this text, that there is a profound Hispanophilia in Professor Lopez Baral's uh, humanistic approach. That overwhelmingly, uh, what she laments uh, uh, from this colonial relationship is in part that this kind of Anglo, Anglo identity and this foreign identity 
is kind of imposing itself and not developing a Puerto Rican kind of identity to emerge and be strong. And all of this, she feels free and very comfortable in using sources from the peninsula, um, the Iberian Peninsula and the Kingdom of Spain. Unfortunately, Andalusian thinkers and figures because she's a specialist in that area. But she does it, unlike a number of activists from Andalusia with whom I have the pleasure to, to be in dialogue with, she does it with more with a kind of, again, a, a profound Hispanophilia, critical to some extent, but it's still very uh, profound Hispanophilia. So what one sees uh, as relevant in her writing is Puerto Rican identity as a kind of Hispanic Caribbean identity. And so the question of blackness does not appear really as strong or as relevant. And this is confirmed in another column that she wrote earlier this year, where entitled, Here We Are Another People. Aquí somos otra gente. And this is a reflection around the uh, census, the US census, and the fact that it asks Puerto Ricans, right, to decide uh, whether you're black, this kind of fixed racial categories. And she, uh, critically revises and critically comments on that nomenclature of the US. But what she defends instead is rather is the state of being mestizo and mixed kind of people. And so, for example, she writes in Spanish, es, es, es que aquí no dividimos tajantemente las etnias o a las que pertenecemos. Los muy oscuros de piel se suelen llamar indios o trigueñitos. No necesariamente nos refugiamos en el eufemismo es que realmente tememos, tenemos todos los tonos posibles de piel. Como era de esperar, nuestra mentalidad racial es tan ambigua como nuestra hibridez étnica. Hemos tenido la fortuna de haber mezclado nuestra sangre con extraordinaria generosidad, por lo que nos cuesta reconocer el concepto de pureza racial. And maybe all of this is very important. I have a limited time. Let me just translate the last part. We have had the fortune that our blood has been mixed um, with extreme generosity. And that's why it costs us, it is difficult for us to recognize the concept of racial purity. And here, as a humanist uh, and humanity scholar, I'm sure that Professor Lopez Vara would agree with, with me that the selection of words is extremely important. And so referring to what she's seen as this mestizaje, as a fortuna, as a kind of uh, great event, fortunate event, that it involves mixing blood uh, with extreme generosity, is not something that many, particularly Afro-Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, more racially marked uh, embodied Puerto Rican subjects would feel about how she characterizes the island. So that doesn't mean that the US categories are kind of proper or can be used, but it doesn't mean that we're just a mestizo country where we're fortunate that there has been this mixture and therefore we don't know anything like uh, purity. Uh, that's not true on the one hand. And second, what we should be more concerned is the still profound anti-black racism that is still exists in the island. And this has been a feature of many mestizo kind of countries, identified countries. You know, the notion of of, of democratic mestizaje or mestizos or democracy in Brazil and other places, that it has been an ideology that usually allows more light-skinned elites in a given context to continue to justify and rationalize their power and their access to institutions like universities, while other communities do not have those opportunities. And this is kind of personal uh, to me. I, I identify myself as a, as a Puerto Rican, I mean, Afro-Puerto Rican. And, uh, and in fact, I uh, barely do this, but I thought that this is a very personal picture. You see in blue the tower of the university, and that's my mother with me in her womb. And she lived uh, back then, clearly enough, close to the campus of the University of Puerto Rico, but neither her nor me when I grew up all until, you know, late in my, in, when I was in high school and so on, we never thought that the university was a path for us or was a space for us at all. 
So from that, if I were to write also the, the history of the university or how the university feel or how the humanities feel to an Afro Puerto Rican, to black Puerto Ricans, then I think probably we'll have different kind of narratives than the one that we obtained from Professor uh, Lopez Barout. And not only, not only uh, 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 me, of course, uh, think about uh, how uh, uh, difficult, uh, in a way, so uh, disturbing was the moment when in the uh, 2010, 2011 strike at the University of Puerto Rico in the same campus, the same campus that Professor Lope, uh, Luce Lopez Baralt is talking about, uh, an agency, security agency, uh, you know, this, th there was uh, a strike, the, 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 you see the police in some pictures, you see from this strike, which actually became the longest student strike in the history of the US, the state side or in any other place. This became, before this was the one, the, uh, uh, the, the one at San Francisco State University organized by the Third World Liberation Front, which gave birth to ethnic studies programs. This one became the longest student strike. And let me read you some description about what you are seeing uh, from Professor Marisol Lebron from her book, Policing Life and Death, Race, Violence and Resistance in Puerto Rico. On the evening, on the evening before the 48 hour stoppage, the firm, this is a security firm, on order from university administrators, demolished the iconic entrance gates to the Rio Piedras campus in an attempt to prevent student strikers from once again shutting down the university. According to student activist Xiomara Caro, when the portones were taken down, when the big doors uh, were taken down, that was the moment when we knew this is war. Capital Security, the company, was for sure the first time uh, uh, that we knew esto va a ser una huelga de mano dura. This, that is going to, this is going to be an iron-fisted response to the strike. While the students did not anticipate the removal of the gates, they were even more surprised by the individuals who showed up wearing t-shirts with the word security. Emblazoned in yellow letters on the front, Capital Security had hired young, inexperienced men and women from Villa Cañona, Villa Cañona in Loiza, a predominantly black and low income barrio in a predominantly black and low income municipality to tear down the portones, to tear down the, the iron uh, gates and act as security personnel during the stoppage and potential strike. According to some of the youth recruited to work security at the university, a municipal employee approached local young people, offering them $10 an hour to work at the University of Puerto Rico. They told us, get in the van, we have work for you. No one trained us for that. Remark a 25 year old from uh, Villa Cañona who worked security during the stoppage. On our archipelago with official unemployment statistics, covering about 16% and where the federal minimum wage was 7.25 an hour, it is not surprising that youths from one of the poorest municipalities in Puerto Rico jumped at the opportunity capital security presented. Professor Marisol Lebron then continues to discuss the difficult situation that you have, where then some of the darkest Puerto Ricans are taken from outside the university to serve as, uh, to police the, the the doors of the university against the students and something and then the students and the media begin to deploy some racist stereotypes about them being kind of gang member talks and so on so you see it was a spiral of racism that was created and what i'm pointing out here is this again that from the perspective of these bodies the university space and what happens inside will be a different narrative from what we find the more Hispanophilic and Mestizophilic humanities uh, portraying. And what I'm pointing down with this in relation also to Black Lives Matter is that uh, human lives, actual lives in precarious conditions should be more important than the humanities themselves. The only hope that the humanities have to be able to uh, overcome their own internal coloniality is to begin to engage in that shift. So now I want to make this point, uh, but now crossing the Atlantic and coming to the stateside US. And I know time will run short, so I will have the slides will help me. 
Uh, but again, hopefully everything will be coherent for you on the other side. So the humanities in the Estados Incorporados de la Nación Estadounidense. I think um, I will give you homework then to maybe if you do a screenshot, write this to, and then try to think why I am describing the US as Estados Incorporados de la Nación Estadounidense. I'm going to tell you, you know, Puerto Rico is supposed to be an unincorporated territory. And in moments when we have like uh, the kind of virulent vulgar racism that comes any single day from the, from the White House, from the federal government, uh, it caused me some happiness or there is some positive dimension about being non-incorporated. And the states are the incorporated ones. So uh, that's even more of a problem here, but I am here in New Jersey, so it's my problem too. So, and I want to talk about context here. The pandemic, Black Lives Matter, and the US Census also that is taking place. And I think that all of this is occurring in the even a la larger context of the demographic change that is, is right now going that I don't think that you can really explain uh, the rise of the uh, extreme right and neo-fascism in the US without accounting with, uh, for this, the fact that in this century by 2042, uh, white uh, Anglo-Saxon whites in the US are bound to lose majority status for the first time. And I think that what we're seeing are shock and all strategies with two goals right now, with the goals of trying to delay the inevitable, on the one hand, with migration policies, deportations and the like. And then within that time between now and 2042, while you try to delay the inevitable, then discipline the population, including migrants themselves, to assimilate to and reproduce the fundamentals of the US national myth. And that is so critical right now that even, as uh, you have seen from the White House recently, there has been a, a, a uh, very direct critic of something like the 1619 project that the New York Times have been kind of advancing with the idea that no, it must be 1776 that is recognized as the one start of the you know, point, starting point from the US nation. There is now a public debate. This is not merely kind of, of culture wars. This is epistemic uh, uh, battle in this context where the US is changing. Uh, now, Black Lives Matter have been make a difference, and that has led a number of or organizations right, in universities to express their support for Black Lives Matter, and some of them to come out more, uh, to engage in a more explicit comment about uh, the existence of racism in university settings. One of them is coming from not too far from where I am speaking right now, uh, Princeton University. And so on September the 2nd, not too long ago, the president uh, of uh, Princeton University shared this uh, statement on the university's efforts to combat systemic racism. And I'm going to comment more about, about this in a second, but I wanted probably you already know that this, this uh, communication, public communication by President Eisgruber uh, has elicited also a strong response from the White House. And as it appears already in September 17, only about a week ago, uh, there were news that Princeton then is under investigation for potential civil rights violations because they are admitting that there is racism in the university and the federal government doesn't recognize, right? That would be a violation of federal guidelines. Uh, of course, if Princeton is preparing itself for the, for the comeback. Uh, but then this is not happening. This is not only, you know, the 1619 project. This is not only Princeton. We also see now the, an attack on race-related tra training sessions, which for many of us, these kind of white privilege sessions and race training are sometimes absurd, absurd, and so because they are so minimal. But what is so minimal to many of us is too much for in this context for certain sectors. 
and particularly for the kind of sector in the U.S. that is represented. First, as you know, by the Tea Party and then by uh, 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 kind of uh, Trump politics. Um, and I am going into politics here because the critique of the humanities, I think the humanities are deeply embedded with a form of liberalism that is the one that is finding itself as the opposite of this kind of virulent racism. And there is now a, that's why it is not an accident that Princeton is being pulled out, not only because of the, you know, trainings and federal trainings about sensitivity, racial sensitivity, but also because um, universities have become kind of the, the home of the liberal arts and sciences, the home of a certain kind of uh, form of complicating historical narratives and thinking beyond the strict uh, myths, you know, foundations of the national myths, and therefore universities also become a target. Now, uh, this, this attack from the, from the White House is becoming as uh, clear and transparent as this, that in September 22, barely two days ago, uh, the White House released an executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping, where um, it says that the requirements for these kind of trainings for racial sensitivity, what they do, and I quote, is promote divisiveness in the workplace and distract from the pursuit of excellence and collaborative achievements in public administration. Now, what is interesting is this. What you're seeing right now coming from the White House is something that we were seeing very directly in other parts of the country. In 2005, I had the pleasure of co-editing this book with colleagues Ramon Grosfogel and Jose David Saldivar. And you see on the, on the underlying, uh, in the underlying parts, we were writing since the 1990s, California has been a laboratory for the right-wing hegemony of the US. These propositions, they were propositions basically to dismantle affirmative action and similar and, and, and in, you know, training in Spanish in California, multiculturalism and so on. These propositions serve as a model for the rest of the country. California became a showcase for the rest of the country in how to kind of that an increasingly a, a, a highly diverse state uh, became a showcase for how to control that uh, supposedly excess in the in diversity and demographic change. And so what we didn't anticipate then, I think the, uh, I don't know, I would speak for a second by uh, the co-editors, my co-editors in that volume, I certainly didn't, was that it was not California at the end who became the, the clearest example showcase. We were close though, it was Arizona. And Arizona is the one that became already in 2010, 2011 and so on, Arizona uh, under the direction of Governor John Brewer um, saw the, right, the, the approval of uh, this uh, resolution to uh, stop immigrants to kind of implement more aggressive uh, racial profiling in the state and actually created also shock and awe. The University of Arizona uh, completed a study about this and they found that uh, the passage of SB 1070 of this resolution, and I quote from that report, led a significant number of immigrants to leave and or, uh, or debate leaving Arizona. They write that these departures anticipated uh, both anticipated and actual had a range of consequences for those left behind, including the loss of friends and family, social and academic problems, anxiety related health effects, and loss of trust in schools. The passage also and the signing reinforce and deepen an existing, an existing mistrust of institutions in the immigrant community. This mistrust reshape people's daily routines and reduce their civic and social engagement. I extend, it extended not just to law enforcement, but also at least in some cases to schools as well. And actually the, the effects on school was very direct because the other angle in Arizona was uh, targeting um, ethnic studies and Mexican American studies in the uh, Tucson public school system. And uh, until the point that between 2010 and 2011, it was found illegal and they were threatened with cutting funding from the state if they did not eliminate their ethnic studies classes, even though there was data that those classes and those programs were actually 
uh, leading to exceptional results in terms of um, having youth staying and finishing, uh, staying longer in school, finishing, and also moving to productive paths after high school. But that didn't matter. Right? So there was the control of bodies on the one hand with S SB 1070 and the control of knowledge, of history, of perspective, again, reconnecting with the humanities now at the fundamental level of public school education. Now, in 2017, you know, because the teachers in, this, in the Arizona Tucson School District and allies, they went against this uh, measure and they won. But it took six years. Now, during that time, barely anyone was paying attention to this. And many of these, you know, again, all of these, I, I, I don't know what Princeton University, how, they, how Princeton University scholars were responding to this, but I don't think that many universities, this was part of, of the radar. This is what happening in Arizona, in high schools, but all of this was a preparation for what we're seeing. And what we did not anticipate was, I was saying before, that it was Arizona and not California. But also we did not anticipate because they, uh, in, in, our, in, our, in our text, we talked about California being a showcase, a model for other states in, to, in terms of how to respond to their uh, increasingly Hispanic populations. We did not suspect that it, would not be, that, that it would be a model not for other states, but for the federal government directly, and that this will come directly from the White House. And the connection was made obvious. Even in 2016, when Jan Brower, the governor of Arizona, uh, endorsed uh, Donald Trump. And you see there was even a, a column in the New York Times then with the title, before Donald Trump, there was Jan Brewer. What we're seeing now was played out in Arizona. And the question is, where were the humanities then? I know where some of us in ethnic studies, I know what we were doing and how this was very important. But what, what were happening with these issues? Now, what was not critically addressed then is now coming forth. So first they came against this, the, the immigrants and the so-called undocumented and these kind of illegal knowledges uh, that supposedly threaten uh, US identity. Now they are going to, for the liberal university itself. Right. And just to conclude this part, not only that, but you know that uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, pardon, Sheriff Joe Arpaio from Arizona, which was like the, the hand if uh, Jan Brewer was the one, you know, the governor, he was the sheriff when this was happening. And uh, he supported Trump in 2016, Trump called call him America's toughest sheriff, and he pardoned him. So while what happened in Arizona, even when there are legal, you know, kind of a, a um, even when it leads to imprisonment, people get pardoned. The perpetrators get pardoned. What is happening is the other side is also seeing an increase in terms that now is not simply ethnic studies, now is again Princeton University. And so, how do I get more concretely again to the humanities from here and why this is so important? It's because it's all connected to the statement by President Ice Gruber. This is from his communication. We must ask how Princeton can address systemic racism in the world, and we must also ask how to address uh, it within our own community. That is true even though for at least the past 50 years the UC University has committed itself to becoming more inclusive. Racism and the damage it does to people of color nevertheless persists at Princeton as in our society, sometimes by conscious intention, but more often through unexamined assumptions and, and stereotypes, ignorance or insensitivity, and the systemic legacy of past decisions and policies, race-based inequities in America's healthcare, policy and education, and employment system affect profoundly the lives of our staff, students, and faculty of color. And then very key, racist assumptions from the past also remain embedded in structures of the university itself. Racist assumptions from the past also remain embedded in structures of the university itself. And so here, what I want to think is the following. When, when President Ice Gruber writes racist assumptions from the past, 
also remain embedded in structures of the university itself. I want us to think it with the, I want us to think of this alternative phrasing. Racist assumptions from the past also remain embedded in structures in, in structures of the humanities themselves. And this is by no means a stretch, actually. And because of time, I'm going to um, I'm going to jump a couple of slides, and I think I'm going to jump a number of questions that I had for you. Um, because uh, I mean, I'm saying that this is it, it comes directly out of this statement. It's not an imposition, and you see it in that the next sentence in the communication that the examples that Professor Eisgruber offers is the following. For example, Princeton inherits from earlier generations at least nine departments and programs organized around European languages and culture, but only a single, relatively small program in African studies. And here is interesting, right? This is very revealing. And then I had a series of questions for you. I'm not going to ask them now in the form of a poll, like how many departments of African studies are in your institutions if you went to your university, how many ethnic studies are there, how many native languages are taught in your university, how many Creole languages are taught in your Caribbean studies units and programs. I'm not going to do it because of time, but if, you know, I suspect that there are not many, and then in a way, all of us should feel reflected all in many universities with President Eisgruber's statement. And so, if so, I want to, 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 to then uh, I think about the following. Actually, even with this statement, I also want to call attention to the following, that even though it's revealing, is 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 a kind of, it's a, it's a potent statement to make, but at the same time, see the selection of words also. It's like Princeton, you know, received from earlier generations. It was like a passive recipient of the past, that it has carried this, it has like this burden, but it's not talking about the ways in which these way of thinking and structure has been actively maintained, both by faculty and by administrators. And many times, sometimes it's faculty and humanities faculty, the ones who defend this structure the most. And that's why I want to bring the question home. And I want to raise the question, what is it in the humanities, like in Puerto Rico, it blinds you to only see Hispanophilia and Mestizophilia and not see blackness, that here in the States, the humanities, seemingly we are very proud of them, but it blinds us to the ways in which they have been complicit with the reproduction of coloniality. And so the question that I have is, what are the coloniality of the humanities? It's a profound question to engage before having any hopes of formulating anything like a decolonial humanities. If you don't assess first the colonial elements in the established hegemonic humanities, um, then we cannot develop a decolonial humanities. And maybe in another invitation, I will flesh out the elements in another presentation of the coloniality of the humanities, because there is not uh, much time now. But let me summarize what this analysis would have led me in my thinking. That the coloniality of the humanities ultimately contribute to two key elements, white benevolence and white condescendence. They are profound almost in every corner of the humanities, I believe. That doesn't mean that there are spaces in the humanities where other things are happening. But overwhelmingly, there is uh, white condescendence and white benevolence. And some of the scholars of the humanities who are in those other spaces where there is not the rule, they will likely tell you and confirm what I say because they have to contend with the weight of whiteness in the field. And this is part of the coloniality of the, human, of the humanities. And what I would say is are the core components of the white academic field. So the humanities, it is often said, they are the heart of the liberal arts and of the university. But likewise, they're also the heart of the white academic field. And we need to address that critically. And we need to do it by engaging in, among other things, a decolonial turn in the humanities that involves a suspension of the view of the value and infinite extension of the humanities. We have to treat the humanities as a human created discourse and structure, not as an extension of the Bible, right? which the status of the humanities kind of replaced the, the authority of the Christian Bible. 
And then somehow it continue having that aura of superiority and that aura of sacrality. And that aura is preserving white benevolence and white condescendence. And I think that we need to suspend that value so that we uncover the coloniality and we can then critically engage it. Second, we need to think more in terms of ecologies of knowledge with my good friend, Buaventura Sosa Santos, rather than perhaps faculties that we're used to think through. And then we need to think about catastrophe and not only crisis. In the humanities, we're always trying to save the humanities from a crisis. And we do not have time to criticize the humanities because we believe that it will come down if we, by neoliberals or overly positivists or scien scientist-driven uh, managers and administrators. But that sometimes not the case. In fact, sometimes administrators are more willing to do engaging creative thinking in the humanities than humanities scholars themselves. So we need to engage uh, into a thinking of catastrophe, which is much more deeper than the crisis that the humanities suffer. Catastrophe is like the humanities, like we thinking that it is an unqualified good, but in truth, being the home of hispanophilia, mestizophilia, white benevolence, and uh, uh, different forms of white uh, uh, supremacy too. Uh, how this is distinguished from what comes from the White House is that there is, what well, from this point of view we'll call maybe a more kind of vulgar white supremacy. This is another kind of whiteness here, but both are lethal forms of whiteness nonetheless. So I move us to the end and leave you with a couple of ideas about how then to operate in the zone of, in, in the, of the decolonial turn in the humanities. This is act three, very short act because the actors are tired, they have to go. No, we're not tired, but we have to close. And I wanted to point out at least a couple of, of activities that we're doing through the Rutgers Advanced Institute of, of Critical Caribbean Studies. One is Caribbeanizing the Humanities, that is trying to cultivate a decolonial turn in the humanities that takes it away from the Hispanophilia, Mestizophilia, and really engages in another kind of activities. These are some pictures from, from activities we have done recently, including a collaboration with the Extraordinary Colectiva Feminista in Construcción, uh, Feminist Collective in Under Construction. They don't like it to be translated though, so don't tell them that I did. Uh, Colectiva Feminista in Construcción in Puerto Rico. I can talk about these events and how they are Caribbeanizing and, and engaging in this decolonial turn in the humanities, if you liked. And second, uh, a call for a Black, Indigenous, and People of Color paradigm of knowledge that a number of specialists in race studies and the studies of racism here on campus, we have uh, generated kind of a proposal. Uh, and we have sent a letter to our, our new president asking him for a conversation around these topics. We want to go beyond diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusions are part of the structure of the white academic field. They have been strategies to minoritized areas like African studies, ethnic studies, all of these forms of studies. We need to go way beyond diversity and inclusion. And this is a proposal. And finally, I want to dedicate this talk to a teacher of mine, also from Puerto Rico, who incarnated a very different sense from the humanities from what I talked about before and has been an inspiration in these projects. Fernando Pico, who was often uh, called humanista de la población penal, the humanist for the penal population. And I had the honor of teaching my first humanities course in a maximum security prison under his tutelage many years ago. Thank you. So before we uh, turn to the questions, I'm just gonna jump in a minute to say, uh, since we all went a little longer than expected, starting with me, um, I think we'll extend the questions till, uh, till 15 minutes after the hour. But of course, if you have um, something you need to do, then uh, please feel free to, to exit whenever. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, Miguel Vazquez, uh, who's going to be uh, reading questions and, uh, uh, and then our speaker will uh, respond to them. So um, thank you, Dr. Thomas, and thank you, Dr. Nelson Maldonado Torres for that um, talk, that was amazing. 
um, as I start the Q&A, if anyone has any questions, just send them into the Q&A chat. Um, but starting off, I'm going to go with uh, the following question, which reads, uh, what about the students at UPR who negotiated with the security officers and began a conversation on precisely the political manipulation of hiring these young men from Louisa. So uh, Dr. Torres, if you'd like to um, take that question. Thank you for the question, because I actually, I wanted to, to bring that up and discuss it. And if you know, one of the pictures in that slide is precisely from that moment, at least one of the moments when one student engaged the, the young folks in the, in, on, the, on the fence. And there is a video on YouTube from a political or dialogues in Puerto Rico, from the University of Puerto Rico, that shows how they are engaging in this uh, uh, political education, but also talking, you know, uh, uh, as young person to young person in Puerto Rico struggling and explaining to them why it was so critical that then the students would go into this action because they could not afford the increases in the, in the fees for education. And indeed, there was, uh, uh, there was also that, and I meant to even play the video, then at some moment I realized I was not going to have time. I put the picture and uh, it said it there in the heading, but I, I had to cut commenting on it because of time. But yes, that, was, uh, that indeed happened and that was a very important moment. But what is even less talked about is the racial dynamics that occurred uh, at the same time. That doesn't speak about, it speaks about the, that, that racism is, is, is everywhere, right? And the fact that when these bodies show up, they generate a number of stereotypes in multiple directions. And when the uh, private company took them, it unleashed, it kind of opened that plethora of, 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 um, of complicated relationships. I would, what I would say is to uh, read Professor Lebron's, Marisol Lebron's text because she has interviews, she has uh, uh, also uh, uh, black students who comment on this and, and, and uh, about this dynamic. And so I would encourage everyone to, to, to go and read uh, Professor uh, Lebron's text about this. But thank you for that. Okay, so uh, moving on to another question. I think we just got one that came in. Um, so I'm gonna click. And this one reads, uh, what approach would you suggest would be appropriate to begin addressing the inequities we can clearly see on our own campuses? And how do we move beyond simple conversations about these topics? These, uh, well, one, one place uh, that is very important to start is to recognize that there has been so much written about this already, profound. And what's happening is that there are mechanisms to, to set it aside. Even sometimes you see when, um, this is what happens with these trainings for diversity uh, awareness and sometimes by the Office of Diversity, that they keep every time kind of repeating the same very basic tenets of liberal approaches to racism. Many of them have proven to reproduce the problems rather than to deal with the situation and sideline other forms of, of thinking, concepts and ideas that can contribute and offer much. Today. So we need to find a way to activate, to, to recognize that plurality of knowledge, uh, some of which has been created, and a lot of it, outside the university itself. Right? So um, the specific strategies, you know, they depend on different universities. Sometimes it can start, you know, from, a, from a students themselves, like even San Francisco State University, how the first ethnic studies emerges students coming together to read texts and ideas that they were not allowed to read, that they, they were not part of the content on their typical classes. And that's how some of the initial ethnic studies classes, because they, they, they created them and they began to teach them. And then the university catch up with them and integrated them. Sometimes it can be that from the, you know, from the ground. Sometimes it can be from someone, because there has been so much knowledge already, someone uh, in the middle or someone at the top, or more than one can start a process. Um, sometimes it is uh, open administrators who are very committed and they try to do something and they are shutting down by the middle management 
and by the permanent chairs, and sometimes by the good humanists, because they distrust everything neoliberal and managerial. And sometimes, even though uh, uh, there may be problems in any given person in the upper administration, they could actually come up with ideas that help to, that are more kind of uh, helpful than many who are in the middle range. But what is important, though, is that there is always a connection. That if you do it from, from below, you see connection with others. And if you're in another place, offer support to those who are below. And if you're doing from the top, don't think that your knowledge will be enough to do what you want to do. You also have to engage in connection, take as an interlocutors, and really take as collaborators, many others, from the student body, to young faculty, staff, everybody. But not in the typical form of, wow, now we send a poll to everybody to see what the community thinks. Administrators also know, and this is part of the trick of liberalism, we already know that the totality, I mean, the greatest majority in the university, uh, you know, it's, not, it's not people of color. And it's not necessarily people of color or not who have been, let's say, uh, seriously engaging these forms of knowledge that I have been mentioning. No, many of us, how we entered into the university was trying to, you know, we recognized the importance and we were enchanted with some elements of what the university offer us. Even the humanities, when I came into philosophy, you are enamored, you want to, to learn more. What they don't tell you though, is that soon enough you begin to discover the limits because the prison of that system begin to, to come down on you. And so quickly enough, you're you know, excited because you come in and then you realize the limits that there are there and you want to break them and you feel the force of why benevolence and why condescending putting you in your place constantly. So what is important is that when you are there, you realize that we can work with others in different spaces to expand and sometimes to break, to break apart from that uh, imprisonment from white benevolence and white uh, uh, condescendence. Thank you. Um, so because of time constraints, I think we might uh, have one or two more questions. Uh, so the next question reads, uh, this person wants to hear more about the proposal in one of your last slides uh, that was given to Rutgers administration. Uh, the one regarding Black, Indigenous, and race studies. So if um, you would just be able to say a few more words about that. Sorry. Well, we are, uh, we're calling for a, a whole paradigm, not, right? Not only for inclusion into an existing paradigm, but for a different paradigm. And we believe, or we note in this document, that this paradigm has two main axes. One of it has to do with uh, socially engaged, rigorous, transdisciplinary understandings and critiques of systemic racism and anti-blackness. That they have to be fundamental in, in everything we do at the university, right? This kind of knowledge about systemic racism and anti-blackness, uh, the scholarship, the critical ideas uh, and the analysis. And the other part is that we are calling for serious attention to and collaboration with intellectual, artistic and social movements, movements that have advanced our understanding of and a struggle against systemic racism and anti-blackness. So the second one has to do not simply with the critique of and the vocabularies and grammars of critique that we need as important as they are, we also have to be in relation, in a, in a constructive generative relation with intellectual, artistic, and social movements that take place inside and outside the academy. We need to break that divide. So the paradigm really takes us outside the conception of the typical, the university with its faculties, which is right, part of the result of, of, the, of the enlightenment, right? Comes from before in the enlightenment uh, period, it was kind of made into the research model of the university. And since then, we are now in the 21st century, working with 19th century models of knowledge and education, not realizing that all throughout there have been major transformations and contributions to knowledge, like Sylvia Winter has pointed out, that in effect may equal, if not exceed, 
the humanistic revolutions that led to the birth of the humanities in the first place. Thank you. Um, so final question, um, and this sort of connects with some of your responses already. Uh, and it's a, it's a bit long, so I'm gonna try to paraphrase. Um, can you say more about how to integrate uh, black indigenous uh, PLC paradigms of knowledge structurally? Um, there are so many traditional fields that will feel threatened during this process. And do you have any strategies or counsel for how to sort of bring this uh, to bear? One is, I believe, to give um, uh, due consideration to the units that do focus on these aspects, right? that there has to be a very strong support for them. Usually, we have a few of these units, you know, some of these top universities, even I don't think Harvard University, there's not even a Latinx studies program, for example, right? They sometimes believe that they can invest only on one program that they try to make successful in their own way, what they understand by success. And they put uh, many resources there. And that's as much as they can do. This also has to do with the rankings, which is also part of the, colon there is the coloniality of the rankings and how universities reproduce that kind of the very structure that the president of Princeton University is talking about that continues to legitimize nine programs for European languages and only one for the entire continent of Africa. They continue to do that because the rankings were made on the basis that those were the important places to have, not places that have to do with Africa or racism or this knowledge. And so the rankings will not change, I doubt. I mean, some colleagues are indeed doing alternative rankings. But the leaders won't pay attention to that. And the board of trustees of different universities won't necessarily be reading at, paying attention to that. So it takes courageous leadership in universities to say, but we are paying attention to that because we really substantively are not going to be guided by the dictatorship of the rankings. In universities, both the scholars and administrators, they tend, they like to talk about as if they think beyond the rankings. But I think when they sit, to justify the programs and the funding, it is a very traditional reference to the rankings that operates. So we need a way of thinking beyond the rankings. That's, you know, paying attention to Black Lives Matters and really recognizing the importance of the moment means that we cannot trust these all ways of justifying this criteria of, of so-called excellence. We have to dare to come up with new terms, new criteria. And some of these programs and units have been cultivating that but they have always been kept in a very minoritized status. Many of them, if at all they exist, many of them only with undergraduate programs, no graduate programs, because of course, graduate training is something that you want to do in a serious discipline, not in an ethnic studies field. Right? All of this is part of racism at the epistemological level. So we need to break through that and show and put investment in the areas and create in the, these departments and these areas that already, uh, invest serious time and efforts in producing this knowledge, and then creating a second phase of funding and the creation of new spaces for collaborations. But you should not have these units that are already doing this work competing with others to get a little bit of the funding. No, they need to be supported. And then the institution needs, needs to learn from those paradigms and need to create yet new spaces and motivate the traditional units to engage more. And when they, if they, uh, units do not see the universities uh, giving serious attention, paying serious attention to these units, you are never going to persuade chairs of history, of English, of philosophy, that they should too. Right? They are going to continue to see it as a matter of diversity and inclusion. Oh, we just need one person to do uh, African philosophy for the entire continent of Africa, while we have 10 specialists in German philosophy of the 19th century only. Uh, so anyway, there are different ways. This is a, a one way, one aspect that I think is, is, is crucial. We need to break away from the coloniality of the rankings and we need more courageous and collaborative leaders all throughout. So thank you very much for that uh, very important talk, uh, perhaps especially important for somebody like me who is 
uh, the director of a center for the humanities. Uh, and uh, one of the unfortunate things, as I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, webinars is you can't have a bit of applause at the end, but uh, I'm sure most of the audience will agree with me in expressing my appreciation for this talk. 